So welcome to this second speed debate today. We called it a speed debate because we wanted to signal to the audience that this is a maybe a rather unusual format in general. We want to put many conversations together and that's why we I think we even invented that word maybe or somehow it came up. Um, um, I'm very happy that I have two excellent guests here, uh, Luis Garicano and Jens Vandenkloster. Luis Garicano is cur a current member of the European Parliament for the Spanish party Ciudadanos. Uh, sorry if I mispronounce it, my Spanish is it was perfect. non-existent. Um, he's vice president of the Renew Group, so that's the liberal group in the European Parliament, and also a member of the Econ Committee and an economist by training. He did his PhD at the University of Chicago and served as a professor also at the LSE. Hi, Luis. And Jens. Very good Van to see you. Thanks for having me. Jens Vandenkloster is a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute of Philosophy of the KU Leuven and a member of the research group, a new normative framework of financial debt at the University of Amsterdam. And not only sits on this panel, but also wrote an excellent report in preparation of this conference um that i think is going to be found in the chat very soon as a link and yeah we're gonna will give us a short introduction to the main findings of his report and then luis can comment right away sounds great so jens the floor is yours and i think you're going to share right yeah 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 thanks a lot and uh thanks a lot for inviting me and also for asking me to write this report and a lot of thanks for um, uh, Mr. Gaigano for, for taking part in the discussion. This so I actually I printed the report, right? Uh, and I'll just briefly go through the, the main points and then really, really move to the discussion. So um, I think maybe briefly connecting it to the, to the previous discussion. So I really agreed with what, what Ben has said, right? So I think in the coming years, we need much more ambitious fiscal policy, in particular in the service of this uh, climate transition. And my report reflects a bit on how to do that in a way that is, as uh, formulated in the title, green, social, and democratic, right? And particularly how to navigate this really old mandate that doesn't, doesn't address these issues that's drafted in a very different era as where we are currently in, how to deal with that and to do that in a way that doesn't just involve the ECB really just drawing its own line, taking its own activist stand by itself, but also that is going to be very different from the original ECB envisaged by the treaty with this very narrow task. Okay, so um, really the, the core of the report is a lot of description of the, the many ways in which the ECB today faces all these new challenges for which its mandate doesn't provide much in the way of guidance. So I discuss a bit really the history, right? This mandate is really old. It's also very narrow. The, the, the trinity that, that, that Ben just mentioned, right? Independence, price stability, and then also, what price stability means is not explained in the treaty, right? And then there's this secondary mandate without prejudice to price stability, the ECB should support the general objectives of the EU. And this is, of course, a very general uh, mandate that, that nobody has any clear way of interpreting and everybody will put their political view forward of, of what the right way to do that is. Now, in a uh, a longer article I wrote with Nick de Boer this year uh, on, on the ECB mandate on the court cases, we diagnosed the situation in terms of authorization gaps. So the ECB faces choices with far reaching consequences for which it mandate does not provide clear direction, right? So it's not, there's one thing that's really correct and the ECB is now overstepping the mandate. The mandate really doesn't tell you. Now, I'll give two examples here. So first, how should the ECB deal with sovereign bond markets, with a sovereign bond market panic? The mandate doesn't really address that issue, right? So in the Eurozone crisis, the ECB has gone into the market, bought bonds to stabilize market, but only very reluctantly. 
for reasons connected, for example, to the so-called prohibition to monetary financing, which doesn't strictly speaking prohibit this, right? And then, of course, because sovereign bonds are so closely connected with doing monetary policy, there are also good reasons for the ECB to do this, but really the mandate doesn't say the ECB should do this, should not do this, and, and if so, how should it do it, right? So that's particularly been an issue for initially SMP, then OMT, then PPP, right? All these bond purchasing programs that the ECB has engaged in. All of that, again, in more detail in the report. And then the second point, and I think that's really important for the future, the mandate doesn't tell the ECB how to deal with climate change, right? So at the moment, the, the design of monetary policy operations is subject to a so-called condition of market neutrality. Now, is that in the treaty? Not really. There are some passages that say the ECB should act in accordance with the market, but it's unclear how to interpret that. And then, of course, as already mentioned, the secondary mandate does tell the ECB, look, you also have to support the general economic policies of the EU. And it's difficult to say that how it's currently doing market neutrality really does that, right? To, just to give one example, today, uh, Lufthansa issued 1.6 billion in uh, um, uh, non-investment grade rated bonds, right? So so-called junk bonds to to fi to to finance uh, uh, itself, and it's difficult to see that the ECB that that Lufthansa would have been able to do that without the very generous conditions which these bonds are currently accepted, and that's just a set of political choices. I think there should, at the very least, be a much longer discussion about whether this is the right way to do monetary policy at the moment. Okay, so, so two very clear authorization gaps that the ECB now faces. What is the solution? Now, in the report, I tried to, look, I briefly address, we can change the mandate. I think it's been said a lot, this can't be done. Um, Tra trade agreements are re regularly ratified. There, there could be a targeted amendment to some of the treaty provisions, and maybe that's something to consider at some point. But crucially, it's not required to do this. And then I sketch two avenues, or uh, rather three in total. I'll sketch two here. Oh, with which within the existing uh, treaty structure, you could provide much more democratic guidance to the ECB on how it should navigate all these new challenges in relation to government debt, in relation to the to climate. So the first is that the EU Council and the European Parliament can in all sorts of way put forward interpretations of the uh, mandate. And this is also why I'm so happy that uh, Mr. Garicano is here to, to talk about maybe possible ways in which also the EP could take a much more active role in providing input into how to interpret these very general provisions in the mandate. And then the second avenue I want to highlight here, that the ECB itself can also do a lot more to connect its policies to existing EU policies, which do set out a more targeted way to deal with these specific issues. So the ECB has in a way already done that, right? So the original bond purchases uh, announced in the OMT program would be conditional on the so-called European stability mechanism which is uh, under the control of the uh, uh, European finance ministers, right? So bond purchases in that context would be conditional on decisions made by political institutions elsewhere in the EU. And I think in a very similar way, you could make the design of monetary policy um, conditional on the so-called green taxonomy that really spells out what counts as green for monetary policy operations. With um, Rens van Tilburg, we wrote a report on so-called green TLTROs that explains how to do this in practice. But here I really want to focus on all these different ways in which we can plug the authorization gaps of the ECB and the roles that, that particularly European Parliament could play in that. Thank you, Jens, for the great report and the presentation. I'm going to directly give it to Luis because this is a speedy debate. Thank you, uh, Marcus. Um, I uh, I enjoyed uh, the Van Kluster, uh, the Van Kluster Jens, Jens's report on the on the ECB's conundrum, which lays out, <clears throat> in my opinion, very well uh, the situation. It, it kind of starts by uh, by explaining what was at the origin of those of those drafters' ideas. I I I was kind of brought back to 
to my time in, in Bruges. I, I studied in the College of Europe before going to Chicago and my thesis, my master's thesis in 91, 92 was uh, on uh, the central bank independence. So I, I uh, Jens, you, you brought me back to all those debates and, and indeed it was informed by, by what later in other contexts was called the Washington Consensus. And, and Jens says, look, I mean, truth of the matter is, uh, this mandate is not really adequate for, for the two challenges. In section three, he talks about how it hinders it from effectively contributing to climate change uh, fight. And in section two, how uh, it's not really kind of allowing this PPP and all these kind of uh, non-conventional uh, uh, policies. Uh, first, already on the sovereign market panics when it, it had the OMTs, etc. Uh, then when, when they wanted to, to get the, the inflation target uh, uh, better, also PPP, but also the APP, the, the uh, Public Administration Purchase Programs. Um, and then, of course, the environmental impact of the operations, which, which tries to incorporate all these three mandates. And, and Jens, basically, his point is, is, is look, um, all these things you're doing are, are not really fitting uh, in. Uh, uh, Lagarde wants to wants the mandate for price stability to be affected by climate change considerations, and and she wants to, um, or she thinks it will be affected. So she thinks that even just narrowly on the price stability mandate, she has a mandate to do these other things. And 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 I'm not unsympathetic to that. Uh, I'll get to that in a second. Let me just first point out Jens's solutions. He talks about treaty change. I think all of us in the parliament, Jens, are, are scared of treaty trained uh, at this point. I mean, we know how traumatic it has been with, with Lisbon and with all the previous changes, uh, the constitution, etc. cetera. Um, citizens use all those treaty changes as opportunities to talk about many things. And this one is, is a, it's a hard one. Then you talk about uh, trying to interpret the ECB manage in a ma mandate in a, in a more, in a broader way. I would argue that you probably can do that for PPP, honestly, even though you're a bit skeptical. Where I really have a little bit more trouble is with climate, and I will be precise about that. And then you say ordinary legislative procedure, and I think that's that's probably that's probably fine. Uh, that's where we where we can agree. You say um, the eligibility criteria for the asset purchase programs. You can use the taxonomy idea that you were just mentioning. Uh, all these other ideas, maybe you can use ordinary legislation. Let me say what I why I agree with Jens uh, and, and in this, and why I think that that, that potentially Isabel Schnabel and, and and Lagarde are going maybe a bit far. I am sympathetic about the ultimate aim, right? The question is whether within the existing mandate, as Jens pointing out, uh, we really can't do that. Um, let me quickly go through 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 Isabel Schnabel's argument. She says, "Look, first of all, climate risk is mispriced. We need to to make sure we correct those 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 mispricings. Uh, there is an externality there. Second, we need to act with climate change. It's dramatic. It's important. True. And and third, the ECB is there. The climate change misprice acting is important, and the ECB has tools." As prudential supervisor, it could kind of help modeling climate risks, as uh, putting the climate risk uh, in the in the balance sheet of the ECB and, and making sure that the ECB, when it's purchasing, knows what it's purchasing, climate-wise as well, and even in monetary policy operations, uh, losing the market neutrality principle. Um, I agree that you know probably this is mispricing. There's clearly a market failure. I agree that we need to act. And so my question with Isabel Schnabel is, can we do these actions within the mandate, and particularly market neutrality? And, and the issue here for me is the following. Uh, we're all, you're a philosopher, uh, Jen, so, so you'll be always kind of mindful of slippery slope arguments, but still, let me make one. Why, uh, why if, if we pass this and we say, well, climate policy is fine, why not Social bonds next. Why will the groups in the left of the of our of our parliament start and Europe forces say, oh, you know, there's also next night in access to housing. The ECB should buy more housing bonds and not these other bonds. Why not social? And if social, if housing, why not uh, pensions? And and we go in some sort of 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 a slope that that worries me. 
John Cochrane has been the best at articulating these, 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 these fears. And if I may summarize them, Marcus, um, I know I have to finish, but if I may summarize them, you have a contract with the voters. You tell them, look, all this monetary policy is a mess. You're not going to understand it. So you give me an objective. You tell me what inflation you want. I don't care as the central bank. You can tell me two, three, whatever. That's your problem. And I will do all this magic, complicated on this, PPP, all that to make sure that inflation gets there. One objective, set of tools, very clear. There is no question independence is a reasonable response because you're driving. You're just telling people, we go there. You drive me. Marcus, please drive the car. I want to go to Madrid. I don't know how to drive. Okay, Marcus says, I'll take you to Madrid. Don't bother me in the road telling me now turn right and left because I know how to drive to Madrid. Fine. Now I tell Marcus, well, now Marcus says, no, no, no. I'm going to Madrid. I have all these other things I want to accomplish. And I'm like, uh, yeah. And they're great for you, man. Luis, don't worry. You know, there's all these things I want to accomplish, buying some food. All these things are all important. Then I'm like, wait a second. I was happy to delegate the driving when the objective of the street was going to Madrid. When you're doing all these other things, rescuing banks, rescuing Lufthansa, uh, green policies, etc., the independence starts to be a really big questionable matter. Because now it's political uh, things. When you ask Snabel, she says, well, we go to the voters and they tell us about climate change. Well, sorry, talking to the voters is my problem. As Jens would say, if you want to talk to the voters, we talk to the voters and we give you a new mandate. Instead of going to Madrid, we're going to Madrid and go below 80 per hour so not to make the tires get old. Okay, now there are two mandates, fine. In my opinion, under supporting the general policies of the union, it's a little bit broad. And as we go down the slippery slope from the clear monetary consensus, Jens was arguing, is just about inflation, to it's about financial stability, which already makes a lot of political decisions. Are we going to support this bank? Is this bank going to die? Are we going to support German banks, not Italian banks? And then third step, we go to environmental and potentially social bonds. Then my opinion, like Jensen's opinion, is we need a new mandate. It cannot be done through treaty change. And for that reason, uh, it's not feasible to do treaty change. And for that reason, I support his view that to the extent possible, the parliament should start thinking of resolutions, legislation, et cetera, et cetera. Thanks, Luis. I mean, you already introduced a great sense of uh, self-moderation by announcing that I'm going to jump in soon. <laughs> um, one thing that I was wondering about next week, the EP is going to actually vote on whether or not they ask the ECB to remain market neutral. And I think your own group has filed an amendment to the rapporteur's uh, report. Uh, the rapporteurs from the EPP and your own group has filed an amendment concerning carbon neutrality. Do you, do you want to say something on that? Is that an issue that you discuss vividly in the group, or <laughs> I assume? And then Jens, you can you can directly step in. Uh, Marcus is uh, Marcus is asking us uh, the proverbial difficult question. Uh, uh, let me read you the text of the amendment. Uh, well, because the ECB's intention to revisit the principle of market neutrality in accordance with its commitment to pursuing carbon neutrality. So um, the group, I think, uh, is, is presenting an amendment uh, that says, it uh, doesn't mean voting, uh, that doesn't mean everybody in the group is going to vote it. It's, there are elements in the group that like it. This is, uh, Marcus, as you can easily anticipate, uh, a very contentious issue. Um, I think, as I told you, the reason is contentious because we all support the first two of Isabel Schnabel's arguments, right? We all agree with her that, look, uh, we have an urgent problem that requires acting and we have an institution that potentially could affect uh, how we deal with this problem. The question is, uh, how much uh, how much do you want to jeopardize the existing way things are? And that's where and that's where people might differ. The big argument in favor is the externality argument. The argument that, look, if the market is not really neutral, then market neutrality is actually not being neutral. Um, the argument against is the slippery slope argument. Uh, be careful with doing things without really initially uh, knowing where you're going. 
Uh, I would probably have a different view as an economist and as a coordinator of the group and vice president for economic affairs. As an economist, uh, and I'm talking right now as an economist, uh, I know you can't separate my persona and don't have different hats. I'm a member of parliament and a politician. But as a professor of economics, let's say, my view is that we need uh, to treat to thread very, very carefully here. Um, uh, we need to find consensus politically, and we'll do our best to find consensus politically. But uh, I, I, as I told you, I think that all of these things need, need, need legislation and need mandates. And I fear that the ECB goes down this path happily, one step at a time. And at some point, people look at it and say, oh, you guys are doing, deciding which businesses to save, deciding which banks to save, deciding which bonds to save we think you guys are politicians and yeah. then the whole construct goes and i do think that right now probably the only institution that it has the capacity to act for europe is the european central bank and as an economist as a politician and as a european citizen if we jeopardize that uh we are shooting ourselves in the foot big 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 time so my view is that uh preserving the independence is such a paramount objective and you know sorry marcos i, I put another argument on the table the thing one that the one that politicians most like in the world is the free lunch if you tell politicians um okay the right way to fight climate is a carbon tax which is what economists would say they're like oh my goodness gilet jaune and uh, you know fires in the streets by people who are complaining about not buying diesel for their tractors if they find a way that they can do it for free or let the European Central Bank buy bonds, they will always opt for that. And, 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 and to some extent, the position has to be, look, climate change is important enough, we need to make the difficult choices. Okay, Jens, what's your take on the slippery slope argument? Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot also for bringing in this very powerful metaphor of uh, the, 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 the ride from Barcelona to, to Madrid, right? I think that, that might maybe also help me to clarify what, what sort of really the push, my push is, right? So, so, so my thinking is, and that also connects to already the perspective that Ben has put forward, right? Look, we need to have a very, very difficult drive, right? If we want to stop climate change, if we want to navigate the EU economy through the 21st century, if we want to solve all the regional inequalities. And I think we come from an era where there was the idea, it's a very simple drive, right? You go from Barcelona, you just tell the driver, look, take me from Barcelona to Madrid, and then the driver can find the shortest route. And that's of course, constitutionally, the least messy thing you can imagine, right? You put it in the mandate, you know where to go, you go for it and, and you do that, right? Now, in light of the situation we are currently in, right, I think we need this communication, right? We need to be communicating with Marcus all the time. There's all these really difficult choices that we need to make along, along the way, to which in part, we also don't know the answer yet, right? A lot of the questions in how to decarbonize the EU economy are just unclear at the moment. I also, as I said, hope that some of these issues of regional inequality come into that, right? That our choices where we built some of this decarbonized economy in, in, the, uh, in the EU economy in such a way that you have a much less concentrated uh, uh, allocation of capital throughout the EU, right? So, so that's sort of the vision where I'm coming from. And from that vision, um, there is absolutely a place for central bank independence, right? There needs to be someone driving that car. You do not want to... Uh, constantly interfere with that. And I think also uh, what Louis said, uh, bring in some judgment, right? So if the instructions are gonna be like, look, uh, completely insane, then the driver can be like, well, you know, is this really how we want to be driving? And there should, should be discussion about that. But I think the hope that we can just, you know, plug in two or three extra variables in what the uh, central bank should be doing. And then we know how to navigate the car the, the 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 coming century, I I think that that was probably also already too ambitious in the 90s, and today we really have to think about different constitutional arrangements. So I really 
uh, welcome also uh, uh, willingness to, to think about ways to do that. I, uh, I, I agree also that probably just a normal legislative procedure is really the right way uh, to go. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really curious how that agenda takes shape in the coming um, years. I mean, maybe a, a quick question on your head as a parliamentarian again, Luis, what would be something that you would demand also in terms of accountability from the ECB? Let's say in terms of getting to know where the car is going or like which, which kinds of uh, information would you like to receive as well that you currently don't get? That's not even about grand treaty change, right? That's also about accountability. Yes, we are we are opening up a process in Parliament and interinstitutional agreement, a new interinstitutional agreement to try to do that with the ECB. That is going to be a question that is going to be debated over the next uh, weeks and months. Uh, the kind of, of, of question that you're you're posing: How are we in a, in a world where the ECB uh, is essentially? I think without any question, the most powerful institution in Europe that can break or make countries, right? To think of of Ireland, okay? The, the, the Irish government was completely against uh, doing the rescues. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was aware that rescuing uh, the, the uh, Anglo-Irish was going to basically sink Ireland. But the financial risks of that were very large and the ECB says, look, uh, we are going to stop the ELA, the emergency liquidity assistance lines, and suddenly, in one day, in 24 hours, Ireland does the opposite of what it politically thought it should do. Uh, in a world where the bank is, is so powerful, uh, political control, uh, political accountability, transparency is, is, is really essential. I think that Parliament has been developing more of a monitoring and more of a controlling role, getting more information. There's a still a lot of information that we are missing. Uh, we're, going to be, we're going to be negotiating and discussing this issue over the next uh, year. But I think that uh, where, where, that's, where that's really going to hit the road. So, so let's separate the two questions that sections two and sections three of, of Jens's, of Jens's uh, point. Uh, somebody's asking us for the Isabel Schnabel piece that I was discussing. Uh, maybe somebody can put it in the chat for the, for the Q&A chat. Uh, it's, uh, it's her speech on... Uh, uh, I can look it up. If, if you don't find it, I'll, I'll we're going to find it, it. Uh, yeah. at the European Sustainable Financial Summit, Frankfurt, September 28th of September 2020. That's that's the reference. Um, so so let me separate the two programs, uh, conventional and unconventional monetary policy, most notably PPP. Um, I think that uh, there is a uh, there is a a. Um, uh, broad view that I, 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 I fear less than Jens, that we are kind of okay with the, contrary to the Kajore Court and, and, and with the European Court of Justice, that uh, this is more or less, more or less about driving from Barcelona to Madrid, that this is more or less in the path. Um, if PPP hadn't happened, we saw it in that week in March, remember, when, 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 when Madame Lagarde said rightly, look, we are not about closing spreads. And she's right, they are not about closing spreads, let's all be honest. But just the fact that she said we're not about closing spreads mean the spreads of Italy and Spain start to skyrocket. I think two weeks later, we would have had the euro crisis. I, I am really, oh, sorry, Marcus. No, no it's, uh, it's okay. No, no, just Marcus is asking me to, to, to finish up. So, <laughs> so I would say first, on, on monetary policy and, and broadly, I would say I'm fine. Once we start getting the portfolio, we really need a, a whole set of new, of new, of new, of new controls. Thank you very much, Luis. Yeah, sorry, the debate no was set to be speedy it's and <laughs> yes, yes, I apologize. And so I give Jens the last words on the session, and then I can say something organizational. Yeah. No, I, I, I think we, we were sort of looking in the same direction. Um, maybe want to clarify one more point. So I think what, what the concept of an authorization gap is trying to do is not to say, look, the PEPP is not allowed, right? What we, so in the, in the longer paper on the, the Karlsruhe uh, judgment, what we're trying to say is something like, look, 
on all these questions, the mandate really doesn't tell you very much, right? It doesn't say it's allowed, it doesn't say it's not allowed, it's just um, uh, uh, indeterminate, right? And I think that is a very uh, a much more useful way to think about the legal situation than to continue these debates like is it allowed is it not allowed right the mandate just doesn't really it doesn't authorize it clearly right but it also doesn't prohibit it certainly there's no reason to think that the PEPP would 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 not be allowed right and i think once you acknowledge that there's just this gap right then i think you should think much more about who gets to put forward the interpretations, right? So is it going to be the ECB by itself? That's probably not the ideal way to deal with these gaps, right? So what's probably much more desirable is to have this much more inclusive discussion about the, um, the, the future of the, the EMU. Now, nothing I've said should, should be suggesting that I think the ECB should not, in the absence of those uh, kinds of involvements, pursue either stabilizing uh, bond markets or greening the financial system, right? I think that's broadly the right direction to be going. But I think to really do that well, also to do that effectively, right? To not be constantly con obstructed by, for example, the, the Karlsruhe Court, what we need is this much more open uh, discussion and to move it away a bit from the legal system, right? So really to hope that either the court in Luxembourg or in Karlsruhe will make any productive contribution to this. I think that that's really not where, where we should be looking and, and hopefully also more political input will make courts a bit more hesitant to wade into these uh, topics. Thank you very much Jens and Luis. Thanks for coming to the session and sorry for pressuring you so much, but I think this was a very nice and short format.